This week, we'll discuss several measures of inequality. Unlike poverty, inequality does not have an official measure, and there are even more variations on how to measure inequality than is the case with poverty measurement. One reason for this is that inequality is affected by all the parts of the income distribution, the bottom, the middle, and the top. Poverty, in contrast, focuses on the lowest part of the income distribution. Inequality refers simply to disparities across people or groups, differences in the amount of income or other resources held by those with different characteristics, or by those with the least resources versus the most. In this module, we will explore two broad measures of inequality, those based on various income or earnings percentiles, and a summary measure known as the Gini coefficient. In the following module, we'll distinguish between inequality between groups and inequality that occurs within a group defined by some observable trait or characteristic. Often, when we speak of income inequality, we focus on specific parts or components of income as well. Income typically includes all sources of income in a household, including earnings of all adults, as well as government and other transfers, and possibly other sources such as gifts. Sometimes, however, we care more about inequality in earned income, earnings inequality, or even inequality in a weekly or hourly wage, wage inequality. Throughout this module, I'll refer to measures of income, earnings, or wage inequality at different times. The measures we will introduce can be used for both income and earnings and other resource measures. When we examine trends and causes of inequality, it can be very important to differentiate income from earnings, but in these introductory discussions, we'll consider at various times income, earnings, and wages. This first graph shows a histogram summarizing the distribution of family income in the United States. The height of each bar shows the fraction of the population with family income in the given range. For example, the tallest bar indicated by the red arrow says that in 2014, just under 6% of U.S. families had total income between $15,000 and $19,999. If you add up all the bars up to and including that tall bar, that says that roughly 18%, or 3% plus 4% plus 5% plus 6 of families have income less than $19,999. Another way to say this is that the 18th percentile of the income distribution here is $20,000. Income distributions such as this form the basis for one type of inequality measure based on percentiles. A percentile of any distribution gives the amount at which a given percentage of individuals have values at or below that value. For example, if 75% of individuals have a height of 5.5 feet or less, we would say that the 75th percentile of a distribution of height is 5.5 feet. Similarly, in 2014, an SAT score of 1780 was the 80th percentile of the SAT score distribution. That means that 80% of people who took the SAT in that year scored 1780 or lower. Now let's go through an example of a percentile of the family income distribution. Suppose we wanted to know how many people earned up to $85,000 in a given year. From the graph shown here, we can see that the share of people to the left of the red box, which represents the income grouping just below $85,000. This part of the distribution includes 71% of the population, adding up all the bars to the left. Therefore, the 71st percentile of the income distribution is $85,000. Remember that 71% comes from adding up the height of all the bars now enclosed in the red area all those to the left of the $85,000 mark. Next, let's talk about some common income percentiles that we use a lot in talking about inequality measurement. Income percentiles become useful to construct measures of inequality when we compare the income levels associated with different percentiles at the bottom, middle, and top of the distribution. Before we turn directly to those measures, however, there's some small technical details to point out. Note the spike at the right end of the distribution shown here. The final bar is relatively high, indicating many families in this income range. This is partially the result of what is called top coding of the data. In the data set used for this chart, families earning more than $250,000 per year report only that they have income more than $250,000 and not the exact amount. This is often done intentionally 
to encourage individuals to give some response to the survey and to protect confidentiality of survey respondents. The second to the last bar on the right shows a different technical issue. This bar, mainly to save space on the chart, has combined families with income ranging from 200,000 to 249,999, an interval of $50,000, unlike the other bars on the chart that include income intervals of just $5,000. It's important to look carefully at the width of categories in a histogram or chart like this to avoid drawing the wrong conclusions about the distribution. Now let's go back to the inequality measures based on percentiles. A simple measure of inequality should capture the idea of how different the circumstances of the best off individuals and the worst off individuals are. Specifically, a common measure of income inequality compares the income level at the 90th percentile, very near the top of the distribution, to the income level at the 10th percentile, near the bottom. This is done by constructing a 90-10 ratio or a 90-10 gap. The ratio is simply the income level associated with the 90th percentile divided by the income level of the 10th percentile. The gap subtracts the 10th percentile from the 90th percentile. So in the example shown here, the 10th percentile occurs at an income level of approximately $11,000 and the 90th percentile occurs at $150,000. So the ratio of the 90th to the 10th percentile here, one measure of inequality, is 13.6, or simply 150,000 divided by 11,000. The 90-10 gap just subtracts the lower percentile from the higher, so the 90-10 gap in this case is $139,000. Why would this, this ratio or gap be a sensible measure of inequality? Imagine an extreme version of increased inequality in which everyone in the economy shown in this distribution, with incomes starting at more than $100,000, suddenly received an additional $50,000 in income, and assume those with less than $100,000 stayed at the same level. That would move all of the bars on the chart starting at the $100,000 mark to the right. Then you would have to go much further to the, end of the, to the right of the graph before you captured 90% of the population. Now, the 90th percentile under this scenario occurs at a much higher level of $175,000. The 90-10 ratio is now higher as well at 15.9, indicating that inequality and this measure of inequality have gone up. If we return to our original income distribution, we can use other percentiles to find interesting and different measures of income inequality as well. The 50-10 gap or ratio is often used as a measure of income inequality. This compares income of those near the bottom to the income level of those in the very middle of the distribution, the 50th percentile. The 50th percentile of a distribution is also known as the median. In this distribution shown, the median or 50th percentile occurs at $52,000. So the 5010 gap would be 52,000 minus 11,000 or $41,000. The fact that there are many potential combinations of percentiles means that different measures of inequality constructed from these different percentiles can disagree. Think back to the hypothetical example of rising inequality we just talked about. In that case, the 50-10 gap did not change at all, since all of the additional income went to people well above the median. Thus, in that scenario, a 50-10 gap would have shown no increase in inequality even though the 90-10 gap showed a substantial increase. We'll work more with these measures based on percentiles in later modules. The Gini coefficient is another commonly used measure of income inequality and one that is more structured than the measures based on percentiles we've been exploring. Imagine a hypothetical income distribution in which income is allocated completely equally among all households or individuals. This would mean that 20% of all income would go to the bottom 20% of all individuals. 40% of income would go to the lowest 40%. This graph, called a Lorenz curve, plots the cumulative percent of total income held by the lowest X percent of households. In the hypothetical case described here of perfect equality, the Lorenz curve is a straight line. Suppose instead we use a Lorenz curve to plot the actual distribution of income. For example, in, the, in 2006 in the US, the poorest 20% of the population received cumulatively less than 5% of total income. The lowest 40% received just 12% of all income. 
When we plot all possible points on the income distribution and, co and connect them, we form the Lorenz curve for the income distribution in the United States. As we move from completely equal income, the hypothetical Lorenz curve, which was a straight line, to a distribution with relatively little income going to the poorest members, the Lorenz curve becomes a, con a convex curve. The area between the actual Lorenz curve and the straight line is the basis for the next measure of inequality. The Gini coefficient is equal to the ratio of the total area between the two curves and the area below the curve under perfect equality. Because the area under the straight line is half of a square with sides equal to 1, we know that the area under the curve must be equal to 0.5. Here we, see, we first see the area under the curve line of perfect inequality. Next, we can see the area between the two curves. In this case, that area is equal to 0.215. The Gini coefficient takes that area between the curves and normalizes it by dividing by the area under the straight line of perfect equality. As inequality increases, the Gini coefficient goes up as well, since the area between the line and the curve gets larger. The distribution pulls away from or moves further away from the line of complete equality. Note that the Gini coefficient will always be bounded by zero in the case of perfect equality and one. To get the extreme Gini coefficient of one would require that all income goes to the single wealthiest individual in the society. This world map shows countries in different colors corresponding to different Gini coefficients. The US, for example, has a Gini coefficient of approximately 0.4. In contrast, some countries in Latin America and Africa, the orange and red areas, have greater inequality and Gini coefficients around 0.5 to 0.6. European and Scandinavian countries, shown here in green, tend to have Gini coefficients in the range of 0.25 to 0.35.